And uh, I want to look at Acts chapter 2. And I couldn't help but think how uh, appropriate it is for us to uh, look at the church and sort of uh, kind of how it, it works out. You know, it's easy how things get complicated, right? Uh, I, I can't help but think when, you know, way back, I don't remember, hun, back when we first got married, it's been 30, 31 years this year? Yes, I got it right. All right. Uh, it's always dangerous. And, uh, you know, and it was funny because we started off with, with not a whole lot. We're, I, I was one year into, into Bible college already. Uh, my wife had been down in college, and then we got married. And we didn't have a whole lot. I, at the time, I worked for a garbage company. I was working on the back of a garbage truck. Not making a whole lot of money. Uh, everything we went paid for our schooling and everything else. So things were tight. I'm probably very similar to many of you when you started off, you're, you're, right? So you kind of think back all those days. And, you know, and we were happy, right? <laughs> uh, Zach, that's you. <laughs> Zach, you can put that for your ringtone. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, at that point, it was just, uh, uh, to get back on track here, uh, how simple things were, because we didn't know any better, right? Uh, ignorance was bliss, and we were so happy, because we didn't know what was going to happen in life, and how it was all going to unfold. And, uh, yeah, I remember thinking, you know, Lord, just let me know what's going to happen. And now I look back, and Lord, I'm glad you didn't let me know. I would have quit a long time ago, right? Anyone else in the same boat? Right? If you knew, forget it. But the Lord sees us through one thing at a time. Give us this day our daily bread, right? We're, each day, Lord, get me through. But in your life has gotten complicated, you know? Kids and careers and, and just... Sometimes mistakes add to the complications, right? And life gives you curveballs, and right? Life gets really complicated really quick. And that's natural. Um, you know, you talk to a young couple who's getting married that things are going to change, right? And that's fine. Enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. But somewhere along the line, we've got to be careful that things don't get so complicated that we lose why we did it in the first place. Right? I think this couple sometimes, okay, you get back to just the two of you for a little bit, right? To, to get back to whether it's your job, your career, right? Sometimes it's good to get back to just sort of the basics. Church is that way. Because, you know, what, what is church? And things get complicated as we start looking at, you know, what is this thing called church? And people have a whole lot of different ideas of what that is, right? This is a building. Uh, the church here, building is, you know, over 150 years old. This is the church. I've had an opportunity uh, to talk to a lady this week, um, and she is a history buff, and she was filling me in on all types of history of the church here, of when actually this building was structured and the, the building there was done later on. Um, this church had a pastor who had the best name of any pastor I've ever seen. And I, I'm, I'm tempted, if someone will pay the legal fees, I'm tempted to change my name to this pastor. He was really early on in the church history. And you ready for his name? Pastor Good Enough. I'm like, now, I'm, not, I'm not fooling. You can take it, the, the history of the church, and he was like, I mean, the third or fourth pastor in the church, but his name was Pastor Good Enough. I'm like, isn't that great? You know, is your pastor like Chuck Swindoll? No, but he's good enough. You know, is he a John MacArthur? No, but he's good enough. Right? I can live with that. I can live with good enough. Right? It's the church, the building. And one of the discussions we had yesterday at men's breakfast, and some of you guys missed it. You need to come out. We have a good time. And one of the discussions came in through, you know, because we see where 
some of, of where the laws are going and churches will maybe lose exemptions because of stands they take, right? And so well, what if we lost this all? What would happen to the church? And then I would say, you know what? We'd all meet at Chris's house. <laughs> oh, Cheryl, he didn't tell you that. <laughs> right? But, right? The, the church isn't the building. But we get that idea that it is. And, and churches have complicated things out. Uh, we were a couple years ago in Minnesota in one of these mega super churches. And you go in there and there's a Starbucks. Uh, they have a bookstore. They're, they have a clothing store. Uh, they they want to make it so you can go to church and do everything you need to do. Right? And that's complicated. Some churches are, have, have schools and some churches have ner- uh, uh, daycares, right? They look in all these things. Uh, food pantries. We get into clothing and helping out. Soup kitchens. Uh, lunches, right? Uh, turkey dinners. There's a church down the road. Has a fantastic turkey dinner. I feed my whole family for like 20 bucks, right? And it's good. You get pie, right? And we look at all these things and, and church gets so complicated, so fast that I think it's imperative for us to occasionally, while all these things are, may not be bad things, and some of them are very good things, but sometimes we need to reflect back on, wait a minute, what's it all really about? The simple church, the church simplified, because the church isn't the building, right? Right? It's not the sign. It's not all those things. The church is what? You. And we got to look at the structure as we discuss what, what church, because, you know, people will say, well, that, you know, the, the church is doing this. Oh, you're doing it? Well, no, no, no. Someone else is, right? We, we want to we wanna forward it off of something else, some other entity. Uh, I'm convinced that there are people who think there are little church fairies that magically make things happen. Right? I, I've been, this, this is the, the fourth church I've pastored. I've pastored over 21 years. Um, I, I've seen a few things. I grew up in church. I, I saw a few things. Um, and statistically, they say that probably 10% of a people of a church do 90% of the work. Right? The church is a place that you come and, and you sit and you listen to the pastor and catch up on your nap and then go home. Right? That's the idea that we have of that is church. No, church is a, a group and assembly together. Right? I mean, if you want to get technical, the, the definition is a church is a New Testament word for ecclesia, which means called out. Oftentimes it's used in a military term. You're, you're called out, called to duty, called to be active. Right? God has established his church. He set up his church to be active of people involved in doing that's the core of it. And it doesn't matter where we are, whether we're here or somewhere else, that we can do this job anywhere we are if we gather together. We're called out. But I want to remind you, if we're called out of something, then we're also called into something. And some ways to get this disconnect. And we live in a day and age where so many people, and I'm sure you run into people like this all the time, who turn around and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. But I want nothing to do with church. Right? How many of you guys have talked or know someone like that? Yeah. Maybe you're feeling that this morning, right? Why am I here? Right? My wife makes me come. Well, I don't know. Right? But we look at this, that, look, part of the deal is, is we are called out of this world. Jesus Christ saved us out of this world, but now he called us into himself. To say that you are a Christian and not being part of a church is not biblically sound at all. Now, you may not be involved in the church, right? But you are part of the church. That's part of the deal. You're called out, but then you're also called into something. Jesus turns around and he lays down the foundation here. Uh, He asks Peter, you know, they go through that famous uh, passage of who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, this is out of Matthew, answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus responds and says, on this rock will I build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not prevail against it. Now look, we are called and established in the foundation that Jesus Christ is God. That he died on the cross for the remission of sin. That he died and was buried and rose again the third day. That is the core of the gospel. The core of the church is Christ and him crucified. We live in a day and age where there's a lot of other messages going out from the pulpits. There are people who gather in churches that may not actually be churches because they're not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. This is his church. We are his people, right? Not on top of the building. I'm talking about the offerings. I'm not talking about all these material things. That comes along for the ride. But you and I are part of this assembly called in together under that banner that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we love him, and we live for him, and we serve him. That he is the corner and, and the center of it all. The book of Hebrews warns us. It says, Not to forsaking the assemblies together of yourselves, as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, see that day approaching. We are called to assemble. We are called to be together. And you know, you may not like me. You know, you might be in for something. Because maybe in heaven, I might be your neighbor. And you'll be stuck with me for a long time, Jim. Right? That in here we are called and we are richer together. The book of uh, Corinthians talks about all the gifts and abilities that God has given his church. We are all called to serve and worship and be together. We need each other. Whether you think so or not, you need me. (laughs) And I need you. And churches are rich because of our diversity. That we are not all the same. We don't all have the same ideas. We don't all have the same passions. We not may have all the likes and dislikes. Right? But you know what? It's that diversity that makes the church such a wonderful thing. Think about this. We're going to go through Acts chapter 2. And as the church gathers, right, it becomes this attractive thing to the world around it. Because if the world looks at us, right, as they look at us and and they see that we love one another, no matter how different we are. If they say, you know, we can get along with each other. You know, we're having our business meeting after this. And I was talking with Mark and there's a, uh, the sermons are getting online, so I got to be careful what I say. So I won't say the name of the church, but there's a church that was up north that was known uh, the people from the town would come to the church because there was always a fight. The sheriff department would come, and uh, it became a big sporting event. And so the town people would come to watch, and they said one year, one deacon took the other deacon and threw him out the front door of the church. Good entertainment. You know? Who wants to be a part of that church? But if they can see the love and care for each other, the acceptance we have for one another, all centered in Jesus Christ, if they can look and say, you know what, that church up there, they can accept a pastor like this, they must be all right. Because they'll accept me too. And I truly believe that we are an assembled body of believers that are all different and all unique and all loved by God. And that becomes an attractive thing. We'll get into that in a little bit. But not to forsaking together. God wants his people now. I'm preaching to the choir because you're here this morning. Right? And there are people who should be here. You know, I'm not a legalistic kind of guy that, you know, you don't show up in church, we're going to show up at your door. Where were you? And I'm not going to scare you and I'm not going to do all that. But I'll tell you, the congregation this morning, we are poorer because some people aren't here. Right? You know, just a little while ago we sang the song, How Great Is Our God. Finally, 
I got it right, honey. And, uh, you know, right? And, and I don't know how it sounds down there, but to hear a congregation turn around and singing how great is our God and hearing that voice, it's just, it's moving to hear that worship. Right? Well, imagine if we had 40 more people here singing that together, right? And now it's not about numbers, but in here, that God's people should begin together. And there's so much that can be done. And I'm going to dare say there's probably a lot that the church here could be doing if everyone pitched in, if everyone was involved. Right? Forsake not the assemblies together of yourselves. And we're going to jump in here. So we talk about what the church is and what it's not. It's not a building. It's not a program. It's not a structure. In here, it's the people. In Romans chapter, uh, Romans, uh, move forward. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 40. We're going to take this down to the, the end of the chapter uh, this morning, because I know we have lunch and everything else. I'm going to cut. So uh, somehow I get into these sermons and I start writing them, and they always end up being in two parts because I have too much to do. So this will probably be broken in half, at least. But I want to start off here. We start talking about the church. Uh, put things in perspective. In the beginning of the chapter, uh, we have Jesus rose and ascended on high. He told his disciples to go to Jerusalem. Go there and wait. And I think they were expecting Jesus coming back. But he said, go and wait. And while we're there in Jerusalem, as they were gathered together, the Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, came and indwelt the believers there. And some miraculous things took place. And people were all marveling, what's going on here? That God has given his spirit to the church. And this is really where the church begins. And Peter gets up and proclaims this profound message, except Jesus Christ, that he was dead, that he rose again, he shed his blood for the remissions of sin, believe and accept him and become his followers. After Peter finishes his message, we start in verse 40 and says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted him, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. As we look at the results of the church, results of the message that was given out, we see the formation of the church. The first thing we see that they received his word, right? Peter preached the message. He preached the gospel. Accept Jesus Christ. Accept his forgiveness. The church is made up of believers who are assembled together. Now, we may have folks here this morning who have not made that personal decision for Christ, and we're glad that you are here. We're glad you're in the church building, but you are not part of the church. That is called out assembly are those who have personally accepted Jesus Christ and his forgiveness of sins. The great news is, is that the door is open. You're all, everyone's invited. If you will accept him, you are welcomed into his body, into his church. And that's the foundation of this. We turn around, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Peter preached the message. People heard and responded. How do I know about God? How do I have faith? How do I increase faith? Guess what? It's by the word of God. I I'm, was really kind of amazed that you know, the last three weeks we went through Romans chapter 1 and talked about the result of taking sin out. And I've had more responses from that. Uh, people were just like, hey, you know, stand on the word. Uh, someone came up and said, oh, you're brave for saying that, right? Can I tell you something? I, I, I'm probably really lazy because I just preach this. You know, I, I have, you know, on my laptop, I have, you know, a thousand some different books and commentaries, and, and I have a bookshelf at home with a whole bunch of different books and stuff like that that I use as reference. But if I'm going to say, what am I going to preach on? I pray, Lord, show me from here what you want me to share. And there are probably churches around where this isn't being preached, and I don't know what material they're getting it from. Right? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is what has the power. 
right? I'm just a, a, I'm just a vessel. I'm, you know, I went down and seen uh, John Maddox, and we were talking, and I sent him up, and he goes, oh, I heard that it was a good message, so I showed, sent him up on, online to see, you know, where you can listen to the message. He goes, I've been listening to your messages. I was like, I feel sorry for you, because I can't stand my voice. He goes, no, no, I haven't been listening to them. I've been watching them because now we're videotaping them and now there's video. And I'm convinced I have the face for radio. And I have the voice for print. It's like, oh, right? You know, I, I, I'm not a Chuck Swindoll. I'm not a John MacArthur. I'm not whatever, Zach, you know, uh, David Jeremiah. I'm not all that. I'm good enough. I like that. Right? Um, but in here, I'm just a vessel, and hopefully it's not what I say, my words. Hopefully, I just got out of the way and let God speak. We want to simplify church, get back to the Word. That this becomes the center of it all. You know, it's interesting because in... Uh, in, in verse 40, he says, it was many other words he testified and exhorted them. See, he saved from the generation and then those who gladly received his word. I love that phrase. Those who gladly received his word. When I accept Christ as my Savior and the Holy Spirit comes within us, one of the things he gives us is a hunger for his word. It is like food. Right? And I like my food. Look at me. Right? I have the desire. What does God say about this? Right? What's God's opinion? I'm hungry for it. I enjoy getting together with God's people. I, I look forward to Sunday. I look forward to seeing you all, because some of you, I only see you once a week, and I look forward to seeing you. Right? We have that hunger, that desire, and here we have within the local church the simplicity of it all, that they heard God's word, and, and it touched them. It made an impact. And I'm amazed how the Spirit of God works. You know, because I like to stand at the back door and shake people's hands. Glad you came. And, and, you know, you feel obligated to say, Pastor, that was a good message. You know, right? That's how it works. But over the years, I've had people come up and I had one guy said, you know, that was a fantastic message you preached on. It really touched me where I was at. I said, oh, good. I'm glad. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, you preach the message that was talking about being faithful. And I'm like, that's not what I preached on. That's not what I preached on. And somewhere along the line, there was a verse that was shared that touched them. And, and that was all they, they were there for to hear that one thing. Right? And they went home and was like, wow, what an awesome pastor that was. He spoke right to my heart. I'm like, that's the Holy Spirit. He just brought that out of left field for you. Right? And maybe you've done that. You've gone home. I had one guy get so mad at me. He, uh, the, the guy came maybe, maybe once a year, maybe, maybe twice. And we're at the back door, and he walked out, and he wouldn't shake my hand. He goes, my wife told you to preach that, didn't she? I was like, what? She goes, we've been fighting lately, and we've been going through, and she, she told you to preach that message. And I'm like, you got me figured out. Because I'm in the middle of a series, and I knew that I preached it, this verse, this verse, I knew by the sixth Sunday that you were going to be here, and you were going to get that. I'm that good. He looked at me. I said, you heard from God. You didn't hear from me. Right? And you've done that. I've done that. Where I've gone through and, and God has spoke to me, stirred within me His truth. Right? It's not about big words. And I, you know, I've sat in church and I've heard messages that were like, Shoo. right? Walked out and have no clue what was being said. Part of church is God speak to me. Right? And sometimes it may be, Lord, get the pastor out of the way. You speak to me. You feed me. You allow me to hear what you want me to hear. 
church simplified. You know, we can fill it up with so many different things. You know, uh, some churches are big on music and they'll have hours of music. Now, music is wonderful, but does not replace the Word. There's a church up north that, uh, once again, I won't say the name, uh, they had a piano player who was fantastic. He came in and uh, he, he's one of these guys that the piano hopped, right? And people would clap. I mean, he was just energetic and factious. And uh, he got a choir going, and they're going through, and they had special music, uh, several numbers, and it was just this wonderful thing. And the, and the pastor, they came to the pastor and said, well, pastor, you know, we want more times. Can you keep your message to 25 minutes? The pastor was like, I can do that. I can tweak. And, uh, and they came up and started more things, and, and finally said, well, pastor, you know, we, can, we, can we shrink the message down to 10 minutes? Can you have 10 minutes because we want more time for all the music and all that? And the pastor's like, oh, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right? It's not a matter of importance that I'm important, more so than the singer, than the player, and all that. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Right? Some get into drama and music and all these extra things, which are good and can be edifying and entertaining. But folks, we've got to be careful and guard the Word of God. Church simplified in all these things. And he said to them, Go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the word of God. Salvation, the core of it all, it's Christ and Him crucified. Then you take a look at what happened after this. You know what? Because of the gospel, because of these things, this comes down to what is the core of it all, of each one of us having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, the Word of God says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth's confession is made unto salvation. That in here, the core of it all, to be a part of the member of the body of Christ, the church, is to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope that you all have made that decision, that choice. The simplicity of it all, of sharing the gospel. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you this morning. It's just as simple. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, I believe that you are God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And Lord, I accept you into my life. A simple prayer like that. Giving your life to God, accepting his forgiveness, welcomes you into the body of Christ. It's that simple. The second thing we see here in Acts chapter 2, Verse 31, and those who were glad to receive his word were baptized. Were baptized. Repent, Peter says in verse 38. Repent to every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible's really clear. I, I kind of call it the, the church waltz, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. If you give your life to Christ, you get saved, you should be baptized, and then join a church. And I think those are steps of obedience that I think every Christian should follow. Then here, notice what it says here. It says, uh, be baptized for the remissions of sins, right? That in here, um, in here, the the... We don't get baptized to be saved. You've got to make sure of that. We don't say that. But because I'm saved, I get baptized. And baptism is no more than that symbolism going down into the waters of symbolizing being associated with Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We go into the waters and we come out. I am crucified with Christ, but now I rise again in new life. And now some are is coming it will warm up 
And it is blessed. Each year we've been here, we've, we've been able to have a baptismal service, and we're going to extend that out. I've already had at least one, maybe two people who's interested in that. If you're here this morning and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first step of obedience is be baptized. And follow the Lord in baptism. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans. He says, Or do you not know that many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism in the death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Then here, this adventure that we have called the Christian life starts at salvation. Salvation is in the end. I think sometimes as evangelicals, we pray for people to get saved, that they'll give their life to Christ. We share the gospel. We want them to get saved. Then they get saved, and then, okay, we're done. You know, that's like saying the wedding is it. Right? That's just the start. That giving your life to Christ is the beginning of this new life together with him. And one of the first steps in that walk is baptism. And if you have any questions on that, we'll probably get into this later on. But if you have any questions on that, please see me. I'd, I'd love to help you and encourage you in those first steps of, of, of walking with the Lord in obedience and baptism. Uh, last year, we actually went out to Fairhaven and, and had baptism out there. I had the privilege of going down in the ocean and baptizing some young men who wanted to commit their lives to Christ and follow him and start off in that newness of life. It's simple. That's the beginning of it all. I want to wrap this up, and then we'll go into talk about what the church does. Uh, but there's an interesting thing, because we talk about joining a church, being a part. Now, once you're a Christian, you're automatically brought into the body of Christ. Now, here, one of the traditions we have is we have a, an official church membership. We hear your testimony, and we come before the church, and we vote on you. We make it a little more complicated. And some churches say, well, it's not biblical, and others say it's not. And I, I just want to put out here that I'm a, actually a pro-church membership because one of the things it does is allow us to carry out the first two, to abide in the apostles' doctrines. That part of what we live in a society where so many churches teach different things, one of the things that church membership does is we look at our church doctrinal statement, and we agree as a group that these are doctrines that we protect of what message is going to come across from the pulpit, of what we encourage, what we teach. So in here, it helps us to preserve those doctrines which are important. Uh, the Bible talks about church discipline, and in here it allows us to have accountability and responsibility for one another. And church membership allows that type of thing. In the early church, you didn't see this at first because they were the only one. Right? So in here, I'm a pro-church membership thing. And if you're here this morning and you want to become an official member of the church here, please see me. That in here, we are a loving, accepting group. If you accepted Christ as your Savior, we invite you to partake and be involved. And we come down to that idea of what church is. Next week, we're going to pick up basically out of the early church, what does it do? What, what does it do? I was going to say what it does, right? We look at this. How does the early church started out? What is a simple church? The basics of it. How do they carry things out? So we'll pick things, things up on that next week. Let us pray. Our dearly Father, we ask your blessing on us as your church. Lord, it's, it's not a matter of buildings and projects or even activities, Lord. It is an assembly together of those who have accepted you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, as part of that, Lord, encourage us to abide in your word. Lord, help us to encourage each other in fellowship. And Lord, in service to you. Lord, help us see past all the preconceived ideas. And Lord, help us to see what you want us to do. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.